camera specially rigged on the tail to give you a close-up view of what happens when you break the sound barrier. Let me tell you what to watch for. First, notice the deep color of the sky, how much darker it is at 45,000 feet where Tony will start his dive. You are not only far above the clouds, but also above the haze and dust of the lower atmosphere. You are looking at the pure ultraviolet rays of outer space. There's the peel off. Now listen as the sound builds up. Usually, there are two thunderclaps. One, when the plane runs away from its sound, and the second, when the sound catches up again. Between the two, you are flying faster than the speed of sound, and it is absolutely silent. Now the sound is building up. The sound barrier has been broken. This is the silence of supersonic flight. Now the pullout is being made. Listen to the noise when the sound catches up. One day, Roger saw a very special airplane. Yipe! What a skybuster! Supersonic flight. The space age dream of countless air enthusiasts. In the 1960s, people imagined boarding a rocket-like jetliner and skimming the edge of space as they roared through the atmosphere at twice the speed of sound. A bevy of air hostesses gathered at the Paris Air Show in 1967 to usher in a new era of passenger flight. At the center of attention was an aeroplane born from unprecedented cooperation between traditional rivals Britain and France. Christened Concorde, it was well named. A beautiful shape of things to come. A model of the Anglo-French Concorde airliner to be carrying 100 passengers by 1970. At Lancaster House, the aviation minister, Mr. Julian Amory, in company with the French ambassador, almost crooned in admiration over the brainchild of their two countries. On behalf of their governments, they signed the agreement for the joint development and production, a foretaste, perhaps, of common market cooperation. Concorde has a perfect pedigree. In the early days, the Ferry Delta II proved faster than sound flying to be possible. Then the French Trident, powered by two jets and a rocket motor, flew twice the speed of sound. At the Bedford Wind Tunnel, flight conditions at these fantastic speeds are simulated. A tremendous help to the designers of the airframe, in this case a model of the Concorde. Watching is the head of the Bristol design team of the British Aviation Corporation. On the test bed here, a Bristol Sydney Olympus engine, the type that will power the Concorde. The same engine has been tested in flight, powering a Vulcan bomber. The Hanley Page 115 demonstrated the possibility of handling the slender Delta Wing aircraft at low speed. More tests were made by the Bristol T-188 Flying Laboratory. With a pedigree like that, the Concorde should capture a big slice of the Atlantic traffic for Britain and France. A thing of beauty, the Concorde, the supersonic airliner being developed and constructed jointly by Britain and France. At Filton, Bristol, the mock-up is well advanced, enough to give an idea of the shape of this soon-to-come revolutionary aircraft. Concorde is more slender than the big jets of today because her passengers, up to 110 of them, will be flown at twice the speed of sound, round about 1,400 miles an hour. Over to France and some of the problems of supersonic speed. Infrared heaters subject the skin of the plane to far higher temperatures than the maximum friction heat of actual flight. A model is being tested in a wind tunnel simulating the airstream behavior at double sound speed. No need to stress the paramount importance of perfect streamlining. Back to England, where Bristol Sydney Olympus 593 turbojets have been chosen to power the Concorde four to each airliner for cruising at 1,400, 65,000 feet up. They're the best possible type. This is a practical expression of Anglo-French cooperation, faith in airliner supersonic flight. 
Till it's achieved, Britain has, among other top jets, the Trident, homing its way in this striking picture from a 35,000 mile sales flight across the world. A superb high performance aircraft for which there promise to be plenty of buyers in plenty of countries. The all-metal Trident jet airliner was a popular choice for airlines and remained a solid workhorse for many years. But it couldn't compete with the glamour and allure of the Concorde. Britain first started working on civilian faster-than-sound aircraft in the mid-1950s, when the Bristol Aeroplane Company developed the Type 233 supersonic jet. At the same time, France's Sud Aviation was working on the Super Caravelle, so in 1962, the two nations joined forces. Partly a reaction against the swift technological strides being taken by the Russians and Americans in their duel to reach the moon, the Anglo-French partnership was negotiated as an international treaty rather than a commercial agreement. But the project was not without controversy. The name itself was initially a bone of contention. Although the British originally spelt it with an E in the French style, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan took offence at a comment from French leader Charles de Gaulle and ordered it to be spelt without the E. Eventually, British Minister for Technology Tony Benn proclaimed that the French spelling would be adopted by both countries, saying the E stood for Excellence, England, Europe and Entente. He subsequently received a letter from an angry Scot who said the Concorde was made in Scotland as well as England. Ben responded that the E could stand for Ecosse, the French name for Scotland, but in his memoirs he noted, and I might have added E for extravagance and E for escalation as well. For it was a massive project, and both sides underestimated the complexities involved. Britain was to construct 60% of the engine and 40% of the airframe, and France to construct 40% of the engine and 60% of the airframe. But with Concorde unlike any aeroplane previously built, the project stretched out long past its due date and chewed up far more than its allotted budget. More than 100,000 detailed drawings were issued to the production companies selected to work on the project. Parts required totaled more than a quarter of a million items, and components inside the parts took the total to more than a million. Firstly, the design teams from either side of the channel forged partnerships, then the production teams began to collaborate. In the early days of designing the aeroplane, the issue of fuel reserves was actively discussed. The manufacturers felt strongly that Concorde should not be subject to the same fuel reserve limits as subsonic aircraft because it cruised at higher altitudes, through calmer, more predictable weather conditions and with less wind, making it easier to calculate fuel requirements. However, regulators at the time disagreed, and lower fuel reserves were rejected for the time being. The original British design had a 90-seat payload, but it was decided that this would be too small to be profitable. It became a priority to increase the Concorde's capacity to make it more attractive to buyers. This was despite the argument that the aeroplane's high speeds made it possible to produce up to twice the seat miles of subsonic airliners. Concorde sales staff faced a challenge, as the world's airlines were contending with an oversupply of seats, leading to diminished returns. They were less than enthusiastic at the prospect of a new type of aeroplane with a speed and range that could make their own fleet obsolete. The airlines were also uninterested in a medium-range supersonic airliner of the type proposed by the French. Thus, Concorde was developed as a long-range aircraft, making it suitable for transatlantic flights. This made it more palatable to airlines, and Pan American took an option on six Concords, Continental Airlines on three, American Airlines four, and TWA four. It was agreed that of the first 18 Concords produced, six would go to Pan Am, six to BOAC, and six to Air France. Even Australian airline Qantas wanted in on the action, with Chief Executive Sir Cedric Turner announcing the Flying Kangaroo was putting in a bid for four Concorde jets. Mr. Turner, we are very glad to have you with us this evening because uh, you, as uh, Chief Executive and General Manager of Qantas, Australia's overseas airline, uh, obviously the very person to tell us something about this, the background to this quite momentous 
news about uh, <clears throat> the authority that has been given to your airline to negotiate for 10 supersonic airliners. This seems to me to be pretty exciting news and we'd like to hear you tell us something about it. Thank you, Mr. Gillison. It is uh, exciting news. We've been working on the supersonic transport project for two years, uh, like many other airlines, and uh, this is the culmination of much work. Although we've only, at the moment, got permission, as you'll see, to uh, pay deposits to secure positions in the line. There's very much more work and negotiation to be done in relation to the U.S. Uh, SST, as we call it, uh, supersonic transport, there's uh, actually no defined aircraft at the moment, and we're paying deposits in the dark. Um, but we are also, of course, uh, enthusiastic about the Concorde, British French uh, project, and that we've got uh, authority to pay deposits on four of those is uh, very encouraging news for us. But there's, as I say, there's much negotiation to be done. Well, what about this uh, um, authority to negotiate for six American airliners? Tell us the picture there. Of course, the American airline, uh, airliner, supersonic airliner, is not yet an airline. Uh, airliner. It's um, being decided about this time, and we'll know more about it within the next few months. But what we are doing there is paying deposits positions in the future line but then uh, in, the, in that case if uh, we don't want to go on with it by the end of 1965 if uh, it doesn't meet our specifications we get the whole of the deposit back this in this instance uh, in this way it is vitally different to the type of contract um, that we are at, mo at the moment discussing with BAC sort of Across the Atlantic, the United States had been developing its own supersonic airliner, the Boeing 2707, or Supersonic Transport, SST. Boeing won a competition to build the jet in 1960. The announcement that Britain and France had combined forces to develop the Concorde put the nail in the coffin for the SST, as there was little evidence of enough demand for the Concorde, let alone another supersonic airliner. However, in the interests of American aeronautical development and superpower pride, work on the SST continued for several years. It underwent many different incarnations, including a variable geometry wing, later abandoned for a tailed delta wing. Some SST supporters dreamed of a sky populated by supersonic airliners, believing the 747 was a passing fad. Not to be outdone, the Russians pushed ahead with their own supersonic airliner, the Tupolev Tu-144, challenging Concorde in some areas of technology, but lacking Concorde's range, sophistication, braking and engine control. Despite many roadblocks, the Concorde vision flew on, with a model taking to the air for flight tests in 1966. The program was feeling some urgency because of the Boeing supersonic developments. But Concorde's designers were also convinced that the American plans were far too ambitious to be achieved in less than a decade. The SST was to have a speed of Mach 3, constructed from titanium, and stretch at least 330 feet long, the length of a football field. A little more modest in scope, the Concorde could reach Mach 2.04, or 2,200 kilometers an hour, and was constructed from aluminium in a relatively conventional design compared to the SST. Its maximum cruise altitude was to be 60,000 feet, and average landing speed 298 kilometers an hour. Dangled below a helicopter on its test flight at the Royal Aircraft Establishment near Bedford, this model was only 1 20th the size of the real aircraft. Although it was attached to the helicopter by a tow rope, the model was controlled independently and could lift, roll and turn, while recording instruments measured its performance. It also had a few moments of free flight. There were many structural issues to be considered in an aeroplane that was travelling at twice the speed of sound. 
With massive forces applied to the aircraft during banks and turns, the outboard elevons were neutralized at high speeds, leaving only the inner elevons active as they were attached to the strongest part of the wing. At this point in its development, more than 20 research establishments in Britain and France were working on the aircraft, and the budget had climbed to 380 million pounds sterling. Gradually, its parts started to take shape in workshops on both sides of the channel. At the Hispano Suiza factory in Tyrus, workers constructed the undercarriage of the prototype Concorde 001. It rested on a four wheel bogey, standing four meters from the point of retraction to the bogey axis. Development of the Concorde was a leap into the unknown for designers and engineers. The machine and assembly shops built test specimens of the advanced RR58 aluminum alloy to ensure it could be fabricated using tried and true techniques. Titanium and stainless steel were also used in the engine bays to combat the high stress and high temperatures. Electron beam welding was perfected to enable production welding of the titanium, previously a very difficult task. At the Filton BOAC factory in Bristol, British workers labored on Concorde 002. Because of the Anglo-French double production line, a new way of manufacturing aircraft came into being. Previously, airplanes had been assembled as a shell, then components inserted inside. With the Concorde, many of the systems were installed at the component stage, then brought to the assembly line already functional. This was the case with the nose and forward fuselage built at Weybridge. The 50-foot long section was made up of the flight deck, the forward passenger cabin, and the nose landing gear bay. When brought to the final assembly line, the sections were fitted with cabin insulation, hydraulics, and air conditioning, comprising 25,000 parts and 90 miles of wiring. In 1967, the design for the 001 and 002 prototypes was revised to reduce drag. The Concorde received a new drooping nose and visor and a longer fuselage. The trademark drooping nose gave the pilots increased visibility when the delta-winged aircraft took off and landed at a high angle of attack. When in flight, the nose was raised to horizontal to allow for aerodynamic streamlining through the air. There was no end to the ingenuity or patience of the Concorde designers. They undertook photographic analysis using Polaroid light to pinpoint the stresses that pressurization forces exert on welds. They carried out experiments to test the effects of kinetic heating on exterior paintwork and the effects of 40,000 hours of wear on seating fabrics. The designers called on the power of analog computers to measure and record the drag forces at various points of an aircraft wing during a simulated flight. And they carried out experiments in wind tunnels that were like test flights in miniature. With this model, aerodynamicists could study Concorde performance in every phase of flight from takeoff to landing. When they came to cutting the metal used in the airplane, a process known as sculpture milling was used. In this process, 90% of the original material is machined away to be salvaged and used again. It was a costly method, but faster than any other, ensuring the structural integrity of the parts produced. Magnetic control of the machining operations ensured maximum speed and maximum accuracy, however complex the component. Chemi etching, another advanced technique, was used to produce components. Forming was done by successive immersions in acid. During immersion, the parts that will finally stand out in relief are protected. The first components to come off the assembly lines in Britain and France were assembled into fuselage sections for extensive structural testing. The components also underwent fatigue testing, where cyclic loadings were imposed on the specimen to simulate the stress and strain of actual flight. For air conditioning tests, a fuselage section was encased in a high-altitude chamber. To check the efficiency of the cabin cooling system, thermocouples took the temperature of the metal passengers. But not everyone was enamored with the technological milestones being reached through the Concorde program. In 1966, a saboteur smashed an important engine part at the Bristol Sidley Aircraft Factory in Bristol. 
The smashed engine part was found with a hammer lying nearby and a note that read, This is the mallet which did the job. I wish I could be here to see the fun. Both workers and management were furious at the sabotage and resolved not to let the incident disrupt their schedule. The aeroplane was due to be delivered 21 months later. Although the sabotage meant the Olympus 593 engine would be affected, factory management was adamant that the Concorde would meet its delivery date. However, the project was already running behind schedule. This was less to do with sabotage and more to do with the complex collaboration between engineers from different countries. There were constant problems with getting on-time delivery from outside contractors, mostly because of the extensive testing required before the materials could be used on the Concorde. To distract attention from what was rapidly becoming a costly and delayed operation, the British trumpeted the opening of a super wind tunnel. High start, and another step towards getting the Anglo-French Concorde in the air. As Mr. Wilson arrived, to officially open cell four, a test laboratory and super wind tunnel. Costing six and a half million pounds, it's the best of its kind in Western Europe. In it, the Olympus engines, which will power Concorde, can be tested under the same conditions they will meet 13 miles high at 1,500 miles per hour. Mr. Wilson took a closer look at the Olympus engine already installed in the giant test bed. Earlier, the Prime Minister had said that the British aircraft industry had much to gain from our entry into the common market, particularly in spreading research and development costs. This new achievement was an example of what Britain has to contribute to a wider European community. Running at Concorde cruising speeds, the power consumed by the test plant is greater than that of the Queen Elizabeth, and the heat generated is colossal. Dispersing it safely through water-cooled pipes has called for great technical ingenuity. When Concorde gets airborne, she'll be one of the most thoroughly tested planes ever to fly. Toulouse, the giant hangar at Sud Aviation's headquarters was the focal point of the world. For inside was the most exciting new thing in the world of aviation, Concorde number 001. The giant gleaming white dart which points the way to the supersonic future of intercontinental transport was about to make its public debut. At last, the Anglo-French brainchild, born out of the technical and very sensible collaboration of two nations, could be shown to an envious world at least five years before any rival. Mr. Wedgwood Ben, Minister of Technology, and Monsieur Jean Chamon, French Minister of Transport, were ready to cut the tapes and launch the greatest airliner ever built. Monsieur Chamon greeted airline representatives, including space helmeted hostess Man Davis. Mr. Wedgwood Ben also had a warm word of welcome for the visitors who had come to see this magnificent moment as Concorde majestically rolled out into the open. English and French technicians proudly watched the result of their work being admired. Theirs was cooperation on a grand scale. For the two ministers, also a time of happy unity. Mr. Wedgwood Ben had settled a point of conflict over the 1500 mile an hour bird. Concorde was to be spelled the French way with an E. From now on, it's an E-type Concorde. Concorde was in accord, Britain and France in partnership. Concorde looked good and certainly will be proved good when it flies at the end of February. That job will be up to test pilots Andre Turka and Brian Trubshaw. Together, Britain and France look set for a supersonic boom time with Concorde. Toulouse, Blanac Airport. Concorde had successfully completed its first official ground tests. At the end of its low-speed run, the special nylon net crash barrier had waited, not needed. French test pilot Andre Turcard, here with Brian Trubshaw, his British counterpart, had made a faultless run in Concorde 001, the great Anglo-French supersonic sky drive. It's anticipated that this Concorde will make its first flight within the next few weeks. The British version will begin tests shortly. But here was the moment the world had waited for. Concorde Mobile under its own power. A 
On this outing, the 148-ton aircraft traveled at a maximum speed of about 35 miles an hour. She is built to fly at over twice the speed of sound. Anglo-French know-how is making the world quite a small place. When the time came for Concorde to make its first test flight, it was a momentous experience. Technology Minister Tony Benn remembered it as quite extraordinary. It was typically British and extraordinarily exciting, and I must say that when I took off, the vibration made me feel like I was being filleted, my skin falling off my skeleton, he said. I did arrange for a supersonic bang to take place over Cabinet, and I told the Prime Minister and no one else. Ben sat behind the pilots wearing a parachute and filming the occasion. He next flew on the aircraft in 1976 with a group of people who had worked on its construction for 20 or 30 years, but had never previously had the opportunity to fly in the luxury jet. Many tests were carried out on the new aeroplanes, including a slate of noise tests. Engineer Dick Hale, a member of the Weybridge Acoustics Department, was one of those who worked on the experiments. At first, engine tests were conducted close to the assembly building. Later, a custom-built ground base was built next to the yet-to-be-operational runway. There were six in the BAC team, all in our early 20s, our team leader being just 24, Hale recalled. I was a new qualified engineer, just six months out of my apprenticeship, and helped set up the equipment, calibrate it, and operate the recording amplifiers and tape deck. The measurements were made around a 60-meter radius centered on the port side engines and covered an angular range from 25 to 180 degrees to jet exhaust. These relatively close-in measurements were to minimize the effects of wind and temperature gradients on noise propagation. The weather conditions were far from ideal with plenty of wind and rain. The ground over which the microphone cables were laid was sodden and the damp wormed its way into much of the measuring equipment causing numerous reliability problems. However, after three to four weeks of intermittent testing, a full set of recordings were obtained, which included single and multi-engine running, operation of the Snecma spade silencers, and qualification of the fixed ground running silencers. The recorded data formed a base for in-flight projections and the study of installation effects of closely coupled engines. Hale said his most embarrassing moment occurred when he was waiting to record the first ever installed engine reheat run. Our French colleagues indicated on the radio that the afterburner was lit. We hit the record button and the mains power to our test equipment dropped out. We looked out of the recording caravan window to see the mains cable flapping in the exhaust of the Olympus engine. At this high power setting, the ground covering the mains cable was eroded by the engine exhaust, exposing the cable and pulling it from the junction box. We buried it deeper next time. The extent of Concorde testing and certification was unique in the history of aviation. The prototype, pre-production and first production aircraft undertook 5,335 flight hours, 2,000 of which were supersonic. It went through four times as many tests as a standard aircraft. The first four Concorde aircraft were really flying laboratories, wired up with 12 tons of electric test instrumentation capable of recording measurements of 3,000 different parameters, including pressures, temperatures, accelerations, and attitudes. This information was recorded to magnetic tape for later analysis at ground data processing centers. In flight, certain information was cabled down to ground monitoring stations. At the front of each aircraft, there was room for three flight observers who monitored the behavior of the airplane and its systems through instruments duplicating the information appearing on the flight deck. One of the most important tests was flutter testing, where vibrations occurring in one part of an aeroplane can set off vibrations in another part, potentially leading to structural failure. But not surprisingly, the extensive testing caused a budget blowout by the end of the process. Originally slated to cost 380 million pounds sterling, the cost had rocketed to more than a billion pounds by 1976 when the aeroplane made its first scheduled passenger flights. On October 1, 1969, Concorde 001 reached a milestone when it flew at supersonic speeds for the first time, achieving Mach 1.5 and flying supersonically for nine minutes. Those on board were astonished at the absence of noise when the visor was raised. Only seven months after that flight, 
four airline captains were given the opportunity to fly Concorde 001. The men trained in the Toulouse Concorde flight simulator and tried out many predicaments, including engine failure and a three-engine landing. They later reported the aircraft was simple to fly and they could see no reason why pilots and engineers couldn't be trained to operate it. The following year, both prototypes reached Mach 2 and passed 300 hours flying time. It was really looking as if supersonic passenger flight was possible. While the military had been flying at supersonic levels for many years, to construct an aircraft capable of sustaining the high structure temperature required for sustained flight was no easy task. Most of Concorde's test flights were flown over sea. However, the British government set up special provisions to enable the aeroplanes to occasionally fly over land as well. A route was designed over Scotland, Wales and Ireland, carefully planned to remain within the range of air and ground rescue services. Fortunately, they were not required, but some people were disturbed by the startling sonic boom that would unexpectedly explode from the aeroplane as it crashed through the sound barrier. The first serious incident in the Concorde program occurred in January 1971, when 001 experienced an engine surge while flying at supersonic speed. One of the movable ramps in the engine air intake broke free, and metal fragments were ingested by the engine, causing a large amount of damage. The engine was immediately shut down, and 001 returned to Toulouse on three engines. The problem was fixed and never returned. Throughout 1971, 001 and 002 toured the world, thrilling people with their exploits. 001 made 16 flights in 15 days to places such as Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo and Buenos Aires. Distinguished guests who tried out the cutting-edge aeroplanes included President Pompidou of France and the Duke of Edinburgh. A trained pilot himself, the Duke even took over the controls for part of his flight. To rub salt into the wounds of the struggling American supersonic program, Concorde soon roared into the United States, arriving at the nation's capital to lobby for landing rights in the US. Some Americans were virulently against allowing Concorde to fly into the United States, citing noise and air pollution concerns. The publicity tour saw the supersonic airliner carrying a plane load of big name personalities, including senators and congressmen, over Mexico to demonstrate the sensation of flying at twice the speed of sound. It was a smart move and opened many doors for the airliner. The public was fascinated with the jet, flocking to airports to watch it take off and land. It was a sad contrast to the Boeing SST project that had, as its Concorde rivals suspected, never got off the ground. It was simply too grandiose a plan to be implemented in reality. We expect to be in service in early 1978. Uh, this is based on uh, getting uh, approximately a year's flying experience with the prototype uh, prior to uh, a start of the production program. So that would put it about five years behind Concorde. Well, uh, it depends on when you decide the Concorde goes into service. Uh, uh, I'm, I think it's more important myself to talk about the difference in first flight dates. So uh, I will only admit to uh, the difference between uh, uh, the first flight of the Concorde this year and uh, our first flight in uh, 1972. However, the American SST program was discontinued in 1971, following protests from environmental groups concerned that SST engine exhaust would damage the ozone layer or disturb people with sonic booms. But even without the protests, it's highly unlikely that the SST was a practical or realistic transportation option. Initially, there had been some concern in Britain that, as with the Comet, its engineers would pioneer new aviation technology only to see the Americans take off with it and race ahead, locking down the market. However, as the Drupnose Concorde powered through the skies, there was no sign of its American competitor. It was a full five years ahead and planned to make the most of its unfettered opportunity. The extra lead time would give the Anglo-French airliner a chance to prove itself in the competitive transatlantic market. Concorde's beautiful design made it a crowd favorite and gave it great prestige and glamour. It was a symbol of a new aviation age. When it flew through the air, it was so fast that other airplanes appeared to be flying backwards. 
In fact, it flew so fast that the weight of everyone on board was reduced by about 1% when flying east, the result of centrifugal forces. In 1976, British Airways became the first airline to take possession of a Concorde. The 200-foot-long Delta Wing aircraft was handed over by the British Aircraft Corporation to British Airways Managing Director Henry Marking just six days before the aeroplane was scheduled to make its first passenger flight. British Airways flew the Concorde to Bahrain for its inaugural flight, while Air France flew to Rio de Janeiro. The Concorde was a revolution in flight time, slashing the journey time from London to New York from seven to three and a half hours. London to Tokyo was reduced from 14 and three quarters to six and three quarter hours. London to Sydney shrank from 24 hours to 13. One aspect of the Concorde's design that surprised many people was the small size of its interior. There was only room for 100 seats, 40 at the front and 60 at the back, and no space for overhead storage, severely limiting cabin baggage. The seats were narrower than most first-class seats on conventional airliners, but as the Concorde only flew during the day and arrived at its destination so quickly, the smaller seats were not an issue for most passengers. Concorde was powered by four Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus 593 engines, which produced 38,000 pounds of thrust. They used reheat technology to add fuel to the final stage of the journey, giving extra power for takeoff and to jump to supersonic flight. Concorde's range was 4,143 miles, and the airliner could carry up to 26,286 gallons of fuel consuming about 5,638 gallons an hour. As Concorde's development was gathering pace, so was the Tupolev Tu-144. The Soviet supersonic aircraft flew many test flights and appeared to be achieving success. However, on June 3, 1973, disaster struck. While demonstrating its capabilities at the Paris Air Show, the first Tu-144S production airliner swerved into a violent downward dive. As it tried to pull out of it, the aeroplane broke up, then crashed, destroying 15 houses and killing all six people on board and eight people on the ground. Debate still rages over the cause of the accident. One theory has it that the jet swerved to avoid a French spy plane that was attempting to photograph it. The original reports did not mention the presence of a Mirage military jet. However, later investigations acknowledged the Mirage, and one official statement said, though the inquiry established that there was no real risk of collision between the two aircraft, the Soviet pilot was likely to have been surprised. Several of the aircraft ended their lives ingloriously as scrap metal, but one became famous as a flying laboratory due to a joint Russia-US partnership. Following a $350 million upgrade, the Tu-144 carried out 19 flights with both American and Russian pilots at the controls, setting numerous supersonic records. Meanwhile, Concorde forged ahead with plans to fly the transatlantic route, despite protests from some quarters. On November 22, 1977, Captain Brian Walpole piloted the jet from London to New York on the aeroplane's first fair-paying flight to that city. Pilot Peter Duffy was a British Airways Concorde captain from 1975 to 1980. In his book, Comets and Concords, he remembers training with test pilots with exercises such as experiencing engine failure at Mach 2.02, more than twice the speed of sound. Spilled air from the intake caused an opposite reaction to what he had expected. Duffy also learned to handle the aircraft without auto stabilization, demonstrating the Concorde's excellent basic stability. He was warned that it was easy to lose height when circling an airfield because although the auto throttles set to control a specific airspeed did an accurate job, a small nose-down pitch could result in descent without the pilot realizing it. Duffy said smoothly landing the Concorde was possible through a simple technique. The delta wing produced considerable ground effect, and as the runway approached, it could be sensed as a cushioning feeling, 
as long as the descent was moderate. The pilot's eye height, similar to that in the 747, is about 35 feet above the runway at touchdown, he said. With a steady approach speed over the last part of descent, the autothrottles are disengaged at about 50 feet wheel height above the runway, and the power smoothly reduced at about 20 feet, with the nose held steady in pitch to counteract nose-down trim forces. Any relaxation of back pressure on the controls allows the aircraft to land immediately and with a bang. Care has to be taken to avoid over-rotating the nose as a tail wheel strike can result. And if this is accompanied by a small bank angle, this can mean contact with the runway by the thrust reverser buckets as they are deployed after touchdown. The lack of side fuselage area and the short wingspan helps to produce very good crosswind performance. The use of roll input into wind for takeoff in strong crosswinds is avoided. At the Paris Air Show in 1971, a series of demonstration flights were made with the first prototype Concorde, carrying government representatives, airline executives, and influential aviation journalists. One journalist, Robert Hotz, editor of Aviation Week and Space Technology, described his flight in an editorial in the next issue of the magazine. The most sensational aspect of flying as a passenger at Mach 2 in a supersonic transport is that there are no sensations whatsoever that differ from those in the current generation of subsonic jets, he wrote. The only unusual internal noise comes during takeoff, briefly from engine rumble. The cabin noise level without full airline-style soundproofing is about equal to that of a current subsonic jet, with only a slight increase near the aft section. Cabin pressurization maintains a constant 6,500 feet environment, even during supersonic climb and descent. During Mach 2 maneuvers, only the changing color of the sky informs the passengers of major banking turns. It is possible and pleasant to walk around during all flight regimes. Stewards will have no trouble serving martinis and meals. Passengers will find no difficulty consuming them. They will just have to drink a little faster. New York will be only a few hours away. Thus, Concords went into service and became a considerable draw card at airports. However, airlines showed little enthusiasm. The world's other airlines looked to the Boeing 747 jet, a conventional airliner that could carry up to 400 people, compared with the Concorde's paltry 100. But Concorde's continued to operate, serving a very well-heeled, exclusive clientele who are prepared to pay exorbitant prices to enjoy a whisper-quiet flight and a glimpse of Earth's horizon from 60,000 feet in the air. On the ground, people would often stop what they were doing when the Concorde went overhead and crane their necks for a better look. Although Concorde flights were abandoned following an air disaster in France on July 25, 2000, the great supersonic airliner remains a powerful symbol of luxury and progress. As a publicity stunt, Sir Richard Branson offered to buy the British Airways Concorde fleet for the nominal one pound paid by the airliner when it took possession of the first Concords. Although the Paris accident was cited as the reason for withdrawing the jets from service, the main reason was a lack of patronage that was making the flights unviable. Where to now for supersonic transport? With subspace passenger travel on the cards, thanks to companies like Virgin Galactic, supersonic flight is back in the spotlight. British company Reaction Engines is researching the viability of a hydrogen-fueled airplane that could carry 300 passengers, capable of flying non-stop from Brussels to Sydney at Mach 5 Plus in 4.6 hours. American aerospace company Aeron has reportedly taken $3 billion worth of pre-order sales on its supersonic business jet. Japan's aerospace exploration agency, JAXA, has performed a series of supersonic test flights in the South Australian desert as part of its plan to develop a new supersonic passenger jet. A few years ago, the first test flight of a Japanese supersonic jetliner design proved spectacular, but it was not the sort of spectacle its designers had hoped for. A problem soon after the rocket launch to boost the unmanned test aircraft into flight resulted in a costly disaster and a lengthy setback for the multi-million dollar project. 
The $10 million tests are designed to open a new era of faster than sound passenger travel by 2020. A team led by Dr. Koji Izumi, JAXA's aeronautical director, conducted a new series of test flights at the Woomera test range in the Australian outback. The last failure occurred due to the electric failure in the autopilot system and it led to the crash. That is what we call the direct cause. We fixed that cause. Besides that, there were subordinate or level two technical problems. We also made a total overhaul of the design. So we divided the cause of the failure into three levels and we redesigned 11 parts and over 100 items in total. The 11-meter experimental jet was carried aloft on a rocket booster to an altitude of 20 kilometers where it separated from the booster at twice the speed of sound for tests on its aerodynamics. The test aircraft is an unmanned scale model of a proposed supersonic passenger jet. JAXA wants to develop an airliner that can carry 300 passengers from Tokyo to Los Angeles in about four hours. The agency is confident it can beat the curse of Concorde and create a supersonic jetliner that will pay its way. The current aviation transportation system is saturated in a sense. When the industry is seeking for cheaper, safer and more comfortable systems, what lags most is the issue of the long-haul flight over 10 hours. It is our belief that this problem will linger and market will definitely keep seeking for the solution of this problem. The arrow-shaped body is designed to reduce the drag from air friction to a minimum, which means the aircraft will use less fuel and cost less to run. But as well as high fuel use, supersonic passenger jets present another problem, noise. Concorde's engines were notoriously loud, and US regulations prohibit sonic booms over land, the thunderclap caused when a plane crosses the sound barrier. JAXA thinks its new design can minimize sonic booms and sees that as a requirement for the economic success of the project. US regulation prohibits the inland flights by aircraft that generate a sonic boom. That was a very restrictive condition and made reduction of the sonic boom a major task. We need to develop technology which can fly anywhere. But Concorde could not solve this and it became its fatal problem. Japan makes aircraft parts for foreign companies but has only a small domestic aircraft industry. A breakthrough in supersonic passenger flight could help Japan leap ahead in the aerospace field. So the supersonic dream lives on. A dream that could see the world become even smaller if aeroplanes can shrink their traveling time further. The great supersonic airliners of the past represented a new era and set many records that still stand today. The complexity of their design and construction has rarely been equaled. Concorde remains an icon of aviation history, with British Airways carrying more than 2.5 million passengers between 1976 and 2003. Millions more enjoyed the view of the sleek Delta Wing as it soared aloft or glided in to land. Many of these people will be hoping it's true that the return of supersonic passenger travel really is only a decade away.